We wanted to design something which felt like a piece of sporting equipment, something which felt tensile, tactile and useful. And we were fortunate in the case of the torch, there's a hell of a lot of um, history. Yeah, I mean, we were really keen for the project to have a very strong narrative to it. It had to relate to the relay in a very strong way. So various aspects of the brief direct us towards the shape of the torch and the whole pattern in the torch as well. And in fact, Locog gave us a brief, an 80 page document which outlined the history of the games, including previous torches, but also things like the, the performance criteria. It has to work in sub-zero temperatures, it has to work at high altitudes and really strong winds. This torch has been tested in the BMW wind tunnel in Munich, up to speeds of I think 75 miles an hour. The design of the torch encompasses 8,000 holes, which represent the 8,000 runners, and the triangular form of the torch which represents the three times that the Olympics has been in London and also the Olympic motto which is faster, higher, stronger. Designers are working behind the most important companies in the world now and I think it doesn't matter where you go in the world you'll find a British designer working there whether it's in architecture, industrial design, fashion design, graphics. You know we are everywhere and, that, and so there's not really a sense anymore I don't feel of, of British design it's more of a kind of good design and, but it's a global thing, it's not a sort of restricted to, to, um, you know, to Great Britain anymore. I started working with Jock Kinnear. He was my tutor at Chelsea. He just came and said, oh, you know, I've got this job and I need someone to help me as an assistant. There was this committee set up by the government um, with Sir Colin Anderson as the chairman to redesign the motorway signs, not the road signs, the motorway signs. And we started a logical system of how to put all the various components together to actually get, get it working. There was no thought of extending it to all the road signs, the whole system, but uh, a, a really bright um, civil servant called T.G. Osborne um, he was the one suggesting to Jock, um, why don't we extend it to the entire network? So, I mean, that was st staggering, really. <laughs> we never thought it would ever go that far. The most difficult one, actually, was the, the, the children, school children crossing. I mean, it was a very difficult one just to draw. The human figure is not easy. And so I spent a lot of time on that. I based the the child on my idea of me as a, a seven, eight-year-old. This is a particularly tricky problem or interesting problem for this show because it's over such a wide um, time span. So there's so many different styles, aesthetics. To that sense, often with an exhibition that's more focused, you've got an aesthetic to play against or or take from, but here we had to find something that would sustain itself through yeah, 60 plus years of, of design. And could adapt a language that we could, it would, have, it would create a common thread through the whole exhibition, but at the same time could adapt, which is done through palette and colour um, from space to space, uh, responding to the, um, to the, to the different periods. It has to have a degree of neutrality to it, so it doesn't contradict any of the aesthetics of the individual periods. Having said that, we had to choose something, and we didn't want to choose Helvetica. There did seem an appropriate choice in um, a typeface designed by Margaret Calvert, uh, Calvert and Kinnear, the creators of the road signage system, one of the e exhibits here, who also created the typeface for the Intercity 125 programme. You know, it has a, a clarity and a strength. In that sense, it's easy to read. And you know, as Paul says, in that sense, it's got a kind of new channel to it. It doesn't fight too much. It seems to have a conceptual link with the idea of you know, a little bit of thread of the state and of good design running through there. But as was still something I think people, you know, connected to. Everyone kind of caught the train or, or saw the ads, and it was a part of everybody's daily life as well. Purposely, it's quite a it's quite a workmanlike typeface, but it does quietly express 
removed like lots of typefaces do. It's not in your face, but it is gently reminiscent of uh, British public design. I mean, there's different areas of British design that I think are particularly good at designing the public space. The, the work, some, like some of the work in this exhibition, the work of Ken Grange, modest forms, quite workmanlike, very well designed, quietly elegant. I was asked to design the inside of a pavilion and I was virtually finished my job and um, I said foolishly in a way um, but I said you know this would be a marvellous job if the cameras if the products weren't so damned ugly and a man on my left who was busy unpacking he was obviously you know something to do with the display arrangements he said um, well that's very interesting he said um, what, a, what would a designer charge a firm like Kodak um, to design a camera and I said well I don't know hadn't thought about it at all. I'd never done anything like that in my life. I said, but I don't know, a few hundred pounds, I'm, you know, that was it. I went back to London, and the following morning the telephone rang, and I'm on my own, in my own little bedroom-come-studio, and um, a man said, I'm head of development at Kodak, and I understand you're going to design a camera for us. And that's absolutely true story, and, and from that then, a whole raft of products came. Uh, this was the first camera I did for them, this one called the 44A, which is a very you know, strange looking thing today, but it was successful. Um, and it then led to 40 odd years of designing cameras for them. And in particular, um, it, this one, which is the one that's in the show. And it, 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 what it does is, is tell you how, if you, if you have some success, and if you have a good relationship with a maker, um, he begins to trust you and begins to listen to you. I've been thinking about who I really admire in, in these days, and I think it's a very tough call because there are plenty of very good designers we have here, you know. Um, and of all the people I know around who I think a big influence, as well as being um, a big single, as it were, practitioner today, um, is Thomas Heatherwick. I think Thomas is a, an exceptional man in... Um, in the scope of his skills, the scope of his intellect. He's very uh, accessible. He's by no means um, a, a prima donna, um, but he absolutely consistently surprises and staggers you with the scope of, of his thinking and the scope of his vision. Getting the chance to design the bus was so special for the studio because London's Transport Authority hasn't commissioned a bus design for over 50 years. It felt that there were all these challenges and opportunities where we want to get wheelchair users into buses and we want to get mothers with buggies and we know that to be reliable with the quantity of traffic on London streets we can't just have one door to a bus so that everyone just waits in a queue. We need a bus with three doors so that people can quickly load and unload. It comes down to all the details. What, what are you going to press? What's the bell push to stop that bus? and what are the steps that you're going to walk up and how's the window and where's your elbow and do you bash your head on the edge. So our sense was that it was going to be a collection of detail and it wasn't going to be just about one big idea. It, we, we needed to have a philosophy that could permeate through and inform all of these details. When I think of British design, I've, I find that somehow one is talking about people from all over the world who have chosen Britain to base themselves. A lot of modern history has been rooted in, in what's come from the United Kingdom and so it doesn't feel like a shallow layer of superficial thinking. And institutions like the Victoria and Albert Museum constantly put things in huge contexts and that's a very soulful backdrop to work around and within.